with me to the book of Acts chapter 26, Acts chapter 26, and we're going to talk about Paul's trial in front of King Agrippa when you stand before kings, Acts chapter 26. While you're finding your way there, a couple of quick announcements for you. Uh, next weekend is Easter weekend, and I do hope that you're going to join us Friday evening at the Palace Theater in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, how this event came about was I really had a desire in my heart to have our whole church family together under one roof uh, to receive communion on Good Friday. And uh, we don't fit under this roof. We have four services in English here in Greenwich. We have uh, our satellite campus in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, we have our Spanish services. And uh, if you look around, this roof just isn't big enough for us anymore. So we got a bigger roof. And uh, it's not only big enough for us, but it's big enough for us to bring plenty of folks to hear the story of Jesus' love. I hope you'll be with us. It won't be the same without you. I want you to know there is plenty of parking uh, all around the Palace Theater. There is a public garage directly across the street from the Palace. Behind the Palace is a big open parking lot. It's a public parking lot. That's where I like to park. Uh, the on-street parking is free in Stamford on Friday because it is a holiday. So I hope that you'll be here. And then next weekend, Easter uh, Sunday here at Harvest Time. Now, beloved, I want you to look around for a second. We have a problem. Um, it's only Palm Sunday, and we're already uh, full up to the gills. So I need some of you to help me out next weekend. And I need some of you that normally come to the 10 o'clock service on Sunday to consider coming to either our Saturday evening service uh, at 5.30 or coming to our 8.30 service. Uh, would you consider coming over to uh, either Saturday evening at 5.30 or Sunday morning at 8.30? Bring a guest with you. Um, if you're not planning on bringing someone uh, with you to Easter Sunday here at Harvest Time. That's all right. The Lord will forgive you. Uh, but why don't you leave a seat here at the 10 o'clock service for someone who is bringing a guest so that we can get everybody in. And don't worry about it. God is Italian. There's always room for one more at his table. And everybody who leaves, leaves stuffed full. So uh, it's going to be a great weekend. After Easter, we're starting something on Wednesday evenings called Fresh Look. And we're going to be inviting uh, our guests who are with us over Easter weekend. You know, we had 400 first-time guests yesterday at the Easter egg hunt, uh, which was just amazing. We're going to be inviting our first-time guests that are with us next weekend uh, to come on Wednesday evenings and take a fresh look at Jesus to take a fresh look at the word of God, to take a fresh look at the Christian faith and at the church. And so we want you to be part of fresh look. We want you to help us uh, fill this place up on Wednesday evenings with people who are seeking right now. I like the term pre-Christians, people um, who are on their way to Jesus and don't even know it yet, but are about to have a collision with him. And so that's uh, Wednesday nights after Easter, and we hope that you'll be part of it. Look with me in your Bible at Acts 26. Actually, we're going to back up into the end of 25, and uh, we're going to talk about Paul's trial before King Agrippa. Acts 25, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 23. It says, the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has petitioned me, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I have found that he has done nothing to deserve death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write, for I think it's silly to send a prisoner to Rome without specifying the charges against him. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. 
So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. We're not going to read all of Paul's words here. He starts out talking about his birth into a Jewish family. He talks about his childhood in Jerusalem, studying under the great scholar Gamaliel. He talks about his career as a Pharisee, as a young man, and his persecution of the church. And then he talks about his encounter with the risen Christ on the Damascus Road. Look in verse 19 of Acts 26, and let's read the, Paul's final word of his defense. Acts 26 and verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with all these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today will become what I am, except for these chains. Then the king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those listening with him, and they left the room. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come. Lord, we thank you for this Palm Sunday morning. We remember Jesus. Lord, your determination to go to Jerusalem to offer yourself up as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. I pray, living Christ, that you would come and overflow this room in our hearts with your presence. Speak to us from the word of God. I ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, if Luke asked me what he should call the book of Acts, I would have told him to call it what to expect. In fact, you should turn your Bible over to the title page of the book of Acts where it says Acts of the Apostles. And you should write in parentheses under it what to expect to remind you that that's what this book is about. The stories of the apostles in the early church are written for our examples they are patterns to us. Their stories show us what we should expect on life's journey and how to handle it. For the last few weeks, we've been traveling with Paul through the center of the book of Acts. We traveled from the Damascus Road to Tarsus and then to Antioch. We went on the first missionary journey. Then we went to the Jerusalem Council. Last week, we were on the second and third missionary journeys. The last chapters of the book of Acts tell us the story of Paul's journey to Rome, to Jerusalem, excuse me, his arrest, his trials, and then his journey to Rome. Paul went to Jerusalem to deliver a large love offering that had been given from the Gentile churches in Turkey and in Greece to the believers in Jerusalem. And along the way to Jerusalem, prophets kept stopping Paul and telling him, Paul, trouble is waiting for you in Jerusalem. But Paul was determined to go because the Holy Spirit had led him. Sure enough, when Paul got to Jerusalem, a mob in the temple almost tore him to pieces. He was rescued by Roman soldiers and arrested. And he spent the next two years in jail going through the Roman court system. Acts chapter 21 through 26 record five different parts to Paul's trial. He defended himself in front of the Jerusalem mob. 
He defended himself in front of the Sanhedrin. He defended himself in front of the governor called Felix. And then when Felix got fired, he defended himself in front of the new governor, Festus. Festus was a novice to the local scene. And the Jews almost tricked Festus to transferring Paul back to Jerusalem where they had laid a plot to murder him. But Paul appealed to Caesar. Uh, only Festus had a, a little bit of a problem. He didn't know what charges to lay against Paul, so he consulted King Agrippa. Beloved, as I look at all of these stories, they remind me of one more thing that we can expect on our journey as followers of Jesus. We can expect to have our faith put on trial. Jesus told us to expect that. He said, you will be handed over to councils and flogged. On account of me, you will stand before kings as my witnesses. For the gospel must be preached everywhere to everyone. And when you stand before kings, do not worry about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the moment, for it is the Holy Spirit speaking through you. Beloved, somewhere, sometime, expect to stand trial before someone on account of your faith in Jesus Christ. You might stand trial in front of your own family. Do you know we have several people here at harvest time who have been estranged from their families. Some of them have even been disowned because of their faith in Jesus Christ. You might stand trial at school Classmates and colleagues might ridicule you. Teachers and professors might make an example of you or dock you because you believe in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. We have a very, very bright young man uh, from our congregation who was in college and his professor said to him, I can't believe that someone as intelligent as you believes the Bible. You might stand trial in your workplace. A few years ago, I had a friend who was a high-level executive in a publishing company. One evening, a few colleagues went out for dinner after work. It, it was after hours. It was informal. It was casual. It was not on company time. It was not on company turf. But they got into a conversation about their different faiths. And he shared his faith in Jesus Christ. The next day, a woman who was at the table went into the human resources department and she filed charges against him for harassment because he had shared about Jesus. I had the privilege of meeting Pat Gelsinger a few years ago. He's the vice president of Intel. And Pat shared some of the very difficult personal trials that he's had in the corporate world because of his faith in Jesus Christ. I was once turned down for a sales job for a company I was working for in Philadelphia because I was a Christian. The owner of the company said, you can't do sales for us. You're too honest. <laughs> you might stand trial among your friends. Those people who remember you from way back when, the old days when you were raising hell and cursing heaven. All of us are already standing trial before our secular society. I don't know whether you've noticed, folks, but society is becoming more and more antagonistic all the time against biblical Christianity. All over the world today on this Palm Sunday, believers are imprisoned and standing trial on account of Jesus. Our prayers go out to Pastor Saeed Abedini, an American citizen who is in prison in Iran. He's bleeding internally from torture, and the Iranian government is refusing him medical treatment or aid. Pray that the U.S. State Department will get involved in his case. Pray that the Lord will release him from prison. It might even be that one day you or I find ourselves before a court or a governor or a king on account of Jesus. Jesus told us we should expect that. But he also said, don't be afraid, because the Holy Spirit will speak through us in that moment. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit will help us to remember everything Jesus said. That doesn't mean that necessarily we'll be able to quote the Gospels word for word verbatim, but it does mean that in the clutch 
the Holy Spirit will help us to speak and to act in a way that's consistent with everything that Jesus said. Looking at Paul's defense before King Agrippa in Acts 26, I find three things that the Holy Spirit will help you remember when you stand before kings. And I want to share them with you this morning. Three things that the Holy Spirit will help you to remember when you stand before kings. First, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember that you are on a mission from God. The Holy Spirit will help you to remember that you are on a mission from God. Jesus said, when you stand before kings, don't worry. Remember, you're there as my witness, for the gospel must be preached everywhere. You're on a mission from God. And mission imparts to you a sense of purpose. Mission gives you purpose no matter what befalls you. Paul was on a wild ride from the Jerusalem mob to the Sanhedrin to Governor Felix in Caesarea, then to the new governor Festus. Festus uh, was a novice and so Paul appealed to Caesar. But Festus didn't know what charges to bring against Paul, so he consulted King Herod Agrippa. Agrippa was curious to meet Paul, so they called the court together in the great hall. King Agrippa and his sister and lover, Bernice, came decked out in their full royal array, purple robes and gold crowns and gold sashes. This was the grandson of Herod the Great who killed all the babies in Bethlehem. This was the nephew of Herod Antipas who beheaded John and turned Jesus over to be crucified. This was the son of Herod Agrippa I who imprisoned Peter and beheaded James. Governor Festus was there in the great hall dressed in his scarlet governor's robes. There were Roman legionnaires and commanders, captains, centurions, all dressed in their full uh, formal military attire. I want to tell you, nobody in the history of the world did pomp better than Rome, not even the British. And all of it was meant to intimidate little Paul, who was standing there in his shackles. Have you ever felt small? Has anyone ever made you feel insignificant? Many, many years ago, Denise and I were invited to the home of a very wealthy woman. This was not someone who was nouveau riche. This was a woman who was world-class wealthy. When we got to her property, we had to pass first through a guardhouse gate. And then a little further down the way, we passed through a a huge set of ornamental gates and there were robotic video cameras that were following our car all the way as we drove up to her property. When we got to the front door, it was about 12 feet high. I looked at Denise and I said, fee fi fo fum (laughs) Two servants let us in and led us down a hall to a, a dining room that had a banquet table that was so long, honestly, you must have been able to seat at least, at least 50 people around this table. And at the far end of the table was our host sitting in front of this roaring fire. And she had her collar turned up around her neck. And for the life of me, she looked like a queen. Uh, I mean, of the Snow White variety. <laughs> and in that moment, I felt really small. I'm just a kid from Philly. I'm a 76ers fan for crying out loud. I eat soft pretzels with yellow mustard on it. I felt very intimidated and we were only there for tea. Here was little Paul standing in chains in front of this massive spectacle of Roman power. But Paul was not intimidated at all. Why? Because the Holy Spirit reminded him that he was on a mission. In the night hours, Jesus came and stood beside Paul's bed and he said, Take courage, Paul. As you testified for me in Jerusalem in chains, so you will also testify for me in Rome in chains. The Holy Spirit reminded Paul that this whole wild ride that he was on wasn't a mistake, but it was a divine setup. 
Paul was not a helpless victim. He was called to preach Jesus Christ. He was called to use any and every opportunity to be heard. He was called to speak to small and to great alike. Paul understood that he was not there before the king to defend himself, but to tell powerful men and women about Jesus. Beloved, can I tell you, in this life, you can expect that your faith will be put on trial too. The entire life, Christian life, is a wild ride. You'll find yourself in places you never expected to be. You'll find yourself in situations that you never anticipated or wished for. You'll find yourself on the spot before colleagues or classmates or co-workers or old cronies or cousins or even kings. But when you stand before kings, the Holy Spirit will remind you what Jesus said. Don't worry, you're there as my witness. You are not a helpless victim. You're called to testify about Jesus. You're called to take that opportunity to be heard. You're a man on a mission. You're a woman on a mission. And mission imparts a sense of purpose to you no matter what befalls you. Not only that, but mission imparts peace in the midst of the storm. Mission imparts peace in the midst of the storm. If you read Acts 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, you'll, you'll find through the entire ordeal, Paul was cool as a cucumber. In Jerusalem, the mob almost tore him to pieces. The Roman soldiers had to pick him up and carry him over their heads through the crowd to save his life. And as Paul is being carried away by the soldiers and the mobs are, are calling for him, he says very calmly to the commander, um, can I say something here? When the Roman soldiers tore his shirt off and began to tie his hands to a pole over his head, the same pole that they had tied Jesus' hands to, to whip him with a cat of nine tails, Paul very calmly says, should you be doing this to a Roman citizen? In front of the Sanhedrin, Paul was in complete control, just as Jesus had been, and Peter and John and Stephen before him. In fact, Paul threw the entire Sanhedrin into chaos. Before Governor Felix, Paul was cool. Before the new governor, Festus, Paul was calm. Before the mighty king Agrippa in his purple robe and his gold crown, Paul was collected. He told Agrippa, I have been obedient to this mission and I have had God's help right up to this very moment. Beloved, that is the peace that comes from being on mission for God. It's peace when everyone else is panicking. It's peace in the midst of the storm. That is the peace that enabled Jonah to sleep while the sailors panicked up on deck. That is the peace that allowed Jesus to sleep in the bow of the boat while the disciples bailed water and despaired for their lives. That's the peace that allowed Paul to sleep in the belly of the ship while the soldiers were tossing the ship's cargo and tackle overboard. Each one of them knew that the God who sent them on their mission was bigger than any storm. Don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. When you're on mission, your life is a win-win venture. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is to gain. No matter what befalls me, I win. No matter how this plays out, I win. If I live to tell people about Jesus for one more day, I win. If I die and I go home to be with him, I win. No matter how this thing plays out, I am coming out a winner because I am on mission. I know a precious saint who's battled a serious illness for many, many years. She's been hospitalized so many times. We've all lost count. And every time she's admitted, she goes to the hospital with a sense of purpose. 
She told me years ago, she said, Pastor, every time I have to go back, I know that there's someone there that God wants me to share Jesus with. And sure enough, every time she's been admitted, she's led someone to Jesus. Sometimes it's the patient in the bed next to her. Sometimes it's a nurse or a technician. She's even led visitors of the patient next to her to Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that that is living on mission? It's the confidence that my life is completely in his hands and that nothing, nothing, nothing can happen to me that's outside of his plan. Three things that the Holy Spirit will help you remember when you stand before kings. You're on a mission from God. And second, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember the resurrection. The Holy Spirit will help you to remember the resurrection. If you read through Paul's trials, you'll find that in each one, the main point of contention was the resurrection. When Governor Festus was explaining Paul's case to King Agrippa, he said it's a controversy about a dead man named Jesus whom Paul claims is alive. In front of the Jerusalem mob, Paul said, Jesus appeared to me, I know that he's alive. In front of the Sanhedrin, Paul said, I'm on trial today because of my belief in the resurrection of the dead. In front of Governor Felix, Paul said, I believe that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive to always keep my conscience clear before God and man. In front of King Agrippa, Paul said, Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I say nothing beyond what Moses and the prophets already said, that the Christ would suffer and that as a first fruit he would rise from the dead, proclaiming light to his own people and to all the Gentiles. Beloved, when you stand before kings... The Holy Spirit will remind you that Jesus is alive. And Jesus is alive means that Jesus is Lord. Paul told Agrippa, I too was once convinced that I should do everything I can to oppose that name. And that's exactly what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many saints in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I went from one synagogue to another, trying to get them to blaspheme the name of Jesus in my obsession against them. I even went to foreign cities to persecute them until one day on the Damascus Road, I saw Jesus. And now I know that I know that I know that he is alive. Amen. Beloved, the resurrection is God's ultimate validation of Jesus life and ministry the resurrection is God's ultimate vindication of Jesus death and the resurrection is God's ultimate authentication of Jesus divine identity Jesus is alive means that he is the one that Moses and all the prophets predicted. Jesus is alive means that he is the one from the line of David, God's holy one who would not be abandoned to the grave nor see decay. Jesus is alive means that he is the Son of God. He is Israel's Messiah and the one and only Savior of the world. Jesus is alive means that he is everything he said he is. He is the light of the world. He is the bread of life. He is the beautiful shepherd. He is the doorway to salvation. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He is the true vine. He's the healer. He's the mighty deliverer. He's the provider. He's the protector. He's with you always. He is the first and the last. He is the living one who was dead but now lives forever and holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Do you remember that first moment when you knew that Jesus is alive? Happened for me when I was just a small boy, one night alone in my bedroom. Prayed a very simple prayer from the depth of my heart, Jesus, 
I want everything you have for me. And his beautiful presence came to me that night. And he has never left me since. One day your faith will be put on trial. But don't be afraid. In that moment, the Holy Spirit will remind you again that Jesus is alive. Fresh conviction will fill your spirit. And it will cause you to speak with courage that compels the court to consider Jesus. You'll say like Paul, I wish you all could experience what I have experienced except without these chains. Jesus is alive means that Jesus is a Lord. And listen, Jesus is alive means that one day we must all stand before a higher court. There's a reason that Paul could be so relaxed in front of King Agrippa. This was just an inquiry. Paul had already appealed to the authority of a higher court in Rome. So it was really out of Agrippa's hands. Agrippa didn't have the authority to acquit. He didn't have the authority to convict. So Paul could just take the opportunity to tell Agrippa all about Jesus. He even cracks a joke at the end. But even more than that, Paul remembered that there was a higher court than Caesar's that will one day judge us all. Paul told Agrippa, Jesus is the first fruits of the dead. Beloved, the resurrection of Jesus is the incontrovertible proof that one day God will raise all the dead, both the righteous and the wicked, and then we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Paul could relax. Because in that moment, he remembered that his fate had never been in the hands of the mob. It had never been in the hands of the Sanhedrin. His fate had never been in the hands of Felix or Festus or even King Agrippa. None of them had the authority to do anything to Paul beyond what God permitted them to do. Do you know when Jesus stood in front of Pilate, he said to Pilate, you have no authority over me except what my Father has given to you. Beloved, one day your faith will be put on trial. But when you stand trial before kings, you can relax because the truth of the resurrection of the dead reduces your earthly trial to nothing more than an inquiry. Your colleagues and your co-workers, they can do nothing to you beyond what God permits. Your classmates and your professors can do nothing to you beyond what God permits. Your old cronies and your cousins, they can do nothing to you beyond what God permits. So relax and take the opportunity to tell them all about Jesus. Remember my friend who was the executive in the publishing company? In time, he became the CEO. That's a position he's held for 20 years now, and he freely tells people in his workplace about his faith in Jesus. In spite of the tremendous opposition uh, to his faith, Pat Gelsinger rose to become the senior vice president and the general manager of Intel. He's the first man to ever go from the tech side of that company to the management side of that company. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can and mere mortals do to me. But if your mission doesn't go so sweetly, if you end up in chains or on a prison transport bound for Rome, never ever forget that heaven's court is watching you and heaven's court is with you. The English reformer Hugh Latimer often preached in front of King Henry VIII who was notorious for being a very impatient man. <laughs> On one occasion, King Henry was offended by Hugh Latimer's bold preaching. And so Latimer was commanded to preach the next week and to issue an apology to the king. On the next Sunday, after he read his text, Hugh Latimer addressed himself. This is what he said. Hugh Latimer... Dost thou not know before whom thou art 
to speak today to the high and mighty monarch, the king's most excellent majesty, who can take away thy life if thou offendest. Therefore take heed that thou speakest not a word that might displease. But then consider well, Hugh, dost thou not know from whence thou comest and upon whose message thou art sent? even by the great and mighty God, who is all present and beholdeth all thy ways and is able to cast thy soul into hell. Therefore, take care that thou deliverest thy message faithfully. And then Hugh Latimer gave King Henry VIII the same sermon he gave him the week before with even more gusto. Beloved, when you stand before earthly kings, remember that the only judgment that matters is that of the king of kings. Three things the Holy Spirit will help you to remember when you stand before kings. You're on a mission from God. Jesus is alive. And finally this, when you stand before kings, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember the awesome power of the gospel. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. When Paul stood in front of the mob, when he stood in front of the Sanhedrin, when he stood in front of Governor Felix and Governor Festus and King Agrippa, he wasn't fighting for his freedom, he was fighting for theirs. Paul wasn't going for an acquittal, he was going for souls. Agrippa was surprised. He said, Paul, are you trying to persuade me to become a Christian? Beloved, one day your faith will be on trial. But Jesus said, when you stand before kings, don't be afraid because the words you speak at that moment will be from the Holy Spirit. Beloved, listen to me on this Palm Sunday morning. And may God give you grace. This is good preaching right here. Whenever you tell your story, the Holy Spirit speaks through you. Whenever you tell your story, the Holy Spirit speaks through you. Paul just kept telling his story over and over again. He told his story. If you read these chapters, they're really quite repetitive. He told his story in Jerusalem. He told his story in Caesarea to Felix and to Festus and Agrippa. He, he told his story again and again. He told his story all over the world. I was once a proud man, self-righteous, arrogant, stubborn, judgmental, and abusive. I once hated the name of Jesus and everyone associated with that name. I once rejected Jesus' leadership in my life. I once lived in defiance to him. I once lived a life that offended to him. But then one day I saw the light. One day something happened in my heart. One day I fell on my knees and I surrendered to Jesus. I said, who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? And now I know that I know that Jesus is alive. I know that I know that I am his. I know that I know that he is with me and that one day I shall be with him. And every time Paul told his story, it got to people. His story got to Felix and Drusilla. It says that Felix was terrified by Paul. That's the same word that describes the heart of the Philippian jailer when he fell down on his knees and he said, what must I do to be saved? As Paul told his story, Felix fell under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. His story even got to Agrippa. And beloved, listen to me. Your story, it will get to people too. It's not because of your great storytelling abilities, but it's because while you're telling your story, the Holy Spirit will speak 
through you and begin to touch somebody's heart. Tell people your story. Tell them what your life was like before you met Jesus. Tell them the struggles. Tell them the sins that weighed you down. Tell them what happened the moment that you met him. Tell them what happened in your heart that moment that you knew that you knew that Jesus is alive. And tell them about your life now. It's not perfect. It's not always easy. There's still things to work through and struggles. But tell them that his beautiful presence has come to you and it has never left you. Beloved, everybody, listen to me. On this week, this holy week, leading up to Easter, I want to tell you this is the best week of the entire year. Friday night is the best Friday of the entire year. This weekend is the best weekend of the entire year. And listen to me. I speak it now. I say it over you. The grace of God is on you this week. I want you to ask God to give you the name of a hard case. Ask God to give you the name of someone who's rejected you a thousand times before. Ask God to give you the name of someone in your family who's been so antagonistic towards you because of your faith in Jesus. Ask God to give you the, the name of someone who said, Lord, that would be the last person I know that would fall on his knees and surrender. And I want you to begin to pray for that person. The prayers of a righteous man are powerful and effective. I want you to use the postcards in your bulletin this morning to invite someone on Good Friday evening, to invite someone on Easter weekend on Saturday night at 5.30 and at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a church in Korea. This is, I'm, I'm going off road here, which is always not a good idea. There's a church in Korea that's, that's thousands and thousands of people. And the pastor has built so many buildings, he doesn't want to build any more buildings. So now, after people have been in the congregation for six years, he tells them they have to leave the church. They have to, he said, look, you've been infused with our DNA, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, so if you've been here six years, you have to go and don't come back. Just go to another church that's dead and start it on life. And he actually goes during worship through the crowd, and he finds people that have been there for more than six years and tells them to leave the surface. So this is your ticket. If you want to come at 10 o'clock, clock next week. This is your ticket. I'm going to stand at the door. You better have a visitor with you if you want to come at 10 o'clock. If you're just coming to take up space, you heard all my Easter sermons already. They're okay. But listen, if you're just coming to take up space, come, come Saturday night and take up space. Come Sunday morning at 830 and take up space. Your ticket to get in here is, is you come with a visitor next week. I'm getting a little silly. All right. That's what happens when you talk too much. But listen, here's what I want you to do. There's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to pray, I want you to invite, but there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to tell someone your story this week. Ask someone for lunch. Ask someone to meet you for coffee. Grab a bite before the Good Friday worship celebration and sit down and tell somebody your story. And while you're telling them your story, the Holy Spirit is going to speak through your lips and touch their heart. They're going to begin crying. They don't even know why. They're going to be trembling. They don't even know why. It's the terror that fell on the Philippian jailer and fell on Governor Felix. It's going to fall on them too. If you want to know what the Good Friday worship celebration really is, and Easter weekend really is, it's just an opportunity for people to go public with a decision that they already made in their heart earlier this week because you met them and you told them your story. When you stand before kings, don't be afraid. Just say whatever is given to you at the moment, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Worship team, come and help me. Finally this. When you stand before kings, the Holy Spirit will help you to remember that Jesus promised your witness will turn people to God. Jesus has promised that God will use you. Standing in front of King Agrippa, Paul remembered what Jesus said to him on the Damascus Road. Paul, you will open their eyes. You will turn them from darkness to light. You will turn them from the power of Satan to the power of God so that they may receive forgiveness 
and find a place among my people. Jesus made Paul a promise that his witness would work. And that promise is our promise too. When your faith is on trial, when you stand before kings, remember that your witness will open people's eyes to eternal truth. The Holy Spirit will use you to persuade people that Christianity is true and reasonable. The Holy Spirit will open you to op- will use you to open people's eyes to see that Christianity is consistent with what God has been doing on earth from the very beginning. Paul said, I'm saying nothing that goes beyond what Moses and the prophets said would happen. Beloved, listen, from Adam to Noah, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to David, to Jesus. Have you been enjoying the Bible on Sunday evenings? I've been enjoying watching the Bible come to life, no matter how inaccurate it might be. I've been enjoying watching it come to life anyway. And it's good that it reminds us that from Adam to Jesus to Paul and the apostles to the first church right down to us, this is one continuous glorious story of God's saving acts in human history. There is only one true religion. It's the religion that began with Adam, that continued with Abraham and Moses and David, that culminated with Jesus Christ and that is carried today by his church. The Holy Spirit will use you to deliver people's minds from the grip of darkness. Listen to me. When you go out there, just remember, people are not right in the head. Some days you ask, is it me or is it the rest of the world? It's the rest of the world, beloved. They're not right in the head. There's a grip of darkness over their minds. But Jesus has promised you will turn them from darkness to the light. Your words, the Holy Spirit is going to use your words to release people from the grip that Satan has on their bodies, on their souls, on their spirits. That's what this series after Easter on Wednesday evenings called Fresh Look is. Listen, the words of man can't persuade anybody to do anything. It's only the power of God that works through our words that loosens darkness off of their minds and releases them from the grip of Satan. We're going to start on Sundays late in April, a series called Clean, and we're going to believe that people who are bound in addiction and who are bound in life-controlling habits and behaviors are going to have a powerful encounter under this roof with the risen Christ and that they're going to be set free. The Holy Spirit will use you to bring people to the moment of decision, to the moment of faith, to the moment of surrender to Jesus. At the end of the inquiry, Paul got very bold. He said to King Agrippa, you believe, King, don't you? I know you do. King Agrippa, who had been watching all of these things from the time he was a boy, was overcome with emotion. He said, in such a short time, Paul, almost persuadest thou me to become a Christian. He stood up quickly and he left the room and the prisoner in chains moved the heart of a mighty Roman king. One day your faith will be put on trial. But when you stand before kings, don't worry. When you stand before kings, don't be afraid. When you stand before kings, remember you're on a mission. When you stand before kings, remember it's not an accident. God has brought you there to be his witness. You're not a helpless victim. You're his spokesman. Remember you're in his hand and nothing, nothing can happen to you outside of his plan when you stand before kings. Remember Jesus is alive. Remember he is everything he said he is remember that your earthly trial is just an inquiry remember that heaven's court is watching you and is with you when you stand before kings remember the awesome power of the gospel remember that as you tell your story the holy spirit will speak 
through you. Remember, Jesus has said, you shall bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit, and fruit that remains. When you stand before kings, remember that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it wherever he will. When you stand before kings, remember that you are a servant of the King of Kings and of the Lord of Lords. I want you to stand up on your feet and I want you to give Jesus Christ a great big praise in this place today. Oh, come on, let's give him a big praise. Come on, let's give him a big praise. Oh, come on, let's give Jesus a big praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, would you say the name of Jesus? Come on, lift up the name of Jesus with me. Come on, lift up the name of Jesus with me. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. All right, listen. Our children's choir is about to come in and they're going to end our service by blessing us with a song. But I want you to do this while they're coming. I want you to lift up your palm and we're going to make a great Palm Sunday choir together. Come on, lift up your voice. Hosanna in the highest. Let's sing. Hosanna.